everyone. Jonathan Baylor here. And I'm uniquely smiley this morning because I have a, a deep appreciation and sense of gratitude to today's guest. Uh, we have none other than Dr. Fred Pescatori, who is, 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 I'm a fan of for many reasons. One, Dr. Pescatori was kind enough to show much love for the Smarter Science of Slim many years ago, back before it was really anything. And this is when his book, The Hamptons Diet, was doing very, very well, and which is also a, a wonderful book I would highly recommend you check out. And Dr. Pescatori is always a delight to talk to, always willing to tell the truth, has an amazing story and practices right out of New York City. So certainly see a lot of people. Dr. Pescatori, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be spreading the news, the gospel, <laughs> according to <laughs> according to New Age Nutrition. I, know, I love it. I love it. Well, actually, uh, Dr. Pescatori, it's it's fortunate that you should start off with that, talking about spreading spreading the good word, because one of the things that initially turned me on to you and your work was how your history as the associate medical director for the Atkins Center for Complementary Medicine, working uh, directly with the late Dr. Atkins. Can you tell us a bit about that experience and really just how so many of my listeners and myself personally have had our experience with traditional doctors is eat more whole grains, eat less fat, and do the very thing that causes diabetes to cure your diabetes. Obviously, you're not doing that, and that's obviously not what the science shows. Tell us. Well, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, okay. Uh, the thing about Dr. Atkins is what people may or may not know to know about him. I started working for him in, in really the dark ages of low fat when low fat was so popular and so prevalent. And, and it was just the dogma that was out there in the world. And it was amazing how his practice still continues to thrive. And what people may not realize is Dr. Atkins was way more than just the Atkins diet. I mean, he truly was one of the, the founding fathers of nutritional medicine, clinical nutrition, integrative medicine, holistic health, whatever you want to call it. He truly was one of the founding fathers, if not the, the, the most modern founding father of this, uh, of this sort of uh, practice. And that's what we did all day. And it was amazing to actually see people get well and to have people take charge of their health, take care of their health, and come from a place of wellness as opposed to a place of illness, um, which always really bothered me about about the medical establishment. It bothered me about pretty much everything that had to do with, with health care, is that we come from a place of, of illness, and we never came from a place of wellness. And, and being at the Atkins Center and, and being part of that environment of people and not just the people who work there, but the patients. I mean, the patients were amazing. We would see 200, 250 patients a day there. And it was pretty remarkable because they all came to be health, uh, to be healthy. They all came to um, not wanting to get sick, not accepting the fact that, oh, I'm just getting older. This must happen to me. And it was really just an eye-opening experience. It made me love medicine again. So that's why I will always be in his debt and always be appreciated, appreciative of him because of, his, of, of how he opened my eyes to practicing medicine in a way that made me really happy and, and gave me a career. Such an inspirational story, Fred. And it, it seems like your career in many ways is characterized by a unique passion for care and for serving the needs of others. Certainly anyone who gets into the medical field has some level of wanting to help and care for others. But you, with your service work, with your continued uh, wellness practice, really seem to personify that. Why do you think you have been able to keep that, that attitude Whereas it seems like some who enter the medical profession end up uh, losing it. Because I, I mean, I think I can keep a good attitude about it because I don't, I don't get, I try not to get involved I mean, with the dogma of medicine. I know what I know, and I know what I don't know, and I know, and and what I do know, I do really well. So I stick to what I know well, and I I I, I try to always take the patient's information that they're giving me and listen to it on multiple levels because what they're telling you tells volumes about what they, what's wrong with them. 
And it's not just, how are you feeling today? It's not just, oh, I have a pain in my stomach. They're telling you volumes about what's going on with them. So to me, it's kind of a real, it's a real challenge. And, and it's always been my goal in life or my sort of mission in life is to get the message across to as many people as I could possibly get it across to. So having been on the radio for seven years and having written, you know, multiple books, probably eight of them at this point, and, and just going out and, like I do, you know, my service work all over the world and, and doing that and helping people who are less fortunate than we are and, and who do need help. I just think it's important. I think it's, it's sort of what doctors should be doing. And yes, we all do get burned out, and we, but, but you've got to be able to work the system in a way that it works for you rather than against you. And I think that's really critical here. Fred, how do you – because I two things. One, obviously, there's there's an intense demand on your time as as a MD. I mean, there's people coming to you all the time. You're a very busy person. But also, if, let's say in contrast to someone who's uh, like myself, someone who's just enthusiastic about this is is on the internet. The the community that I surround myself with is a community that is very supportive of using nutrition and and wellness to to heal oneself fundamentally. While in the uh, traditional Western medical community, I could imagine that would be looked upon less optimally. So not only uh, do you have the the, the struggle of, of, of busyness and constant demands on your time, but how do you deal with the fact that the community that you're in may not be as supportive at, at this approach itself? Well, they're not supportive. I mean, you put it very light, <laughs> very nicely. <laughs> uh, they, I mean, they're more supportive than they ever were. Having said that, that is that is sort of going from zero to zero point zero zero seven five. You know, they have not, <laughs> they've not budged very much at all. But uh, at least they recognize that CoQ10 may do something if you're taking a statin drug, or they realize you know there there are certain things that they do realize that are inherent. Uh, but what they won't realize are the big picture issues. They will never realize that. The, the what they've been saying all along about diabetes has been killing us. They'll never say, they will never admit that this entire obesity epidemic, they started. Mm-hmm. Uh, they will never admit the, the bigger items. They will never admit, I mean, that story that came out about salt just recently. I mean, we've been saying that salt is, is has nothing to do with, with anything, and the American Heart Association still with this latest study will not come out and say, will not change its position on salt. Mm-hmm. So you're dealing with very, very powerful organizations, very, very powerful lobbying organizations who will who stand to lose a lot of money if they change their policy on things. So that gets that gets, of course, filtered down to the troops. And who are the troops? The troops are the doctors. The troops are the ones that are out there in the field. And especially now that big pharma is so such a vital part of medicine, like you cannot there's very few hospitals or medical schools that can exist without pharmaceutical money. So you've got to, you've got to play, you've got to play with that. If you want to have hospital privileges, if you want to become the best name, the best doctor in America, you know, that sort of thing, you've got to play the play by the rules. And those rules are made by people who are making money off of you. So I, I don't care as much that these other doctors throw the slings and arrows at me because I know what I'm doing is correct. And I just feel badly for them that they don't have the time nor the eagerness nor the willingness to actually read the literature because I read the same literature they do. And how could we come to two completely different positions on it? So it's unfortunate that they don't take the time to read it and look at how much nutritional science is coming out. Just because they don't have some person banging down their doors, bringing them lunch, and saying, here's, here's the best supplement you should take, doesn't necessarily mean these things don't exist and they don't work. And that's, that's you know, I just, I feel badly for them. That's the way I look at it, basically. I mean, they look askance at me, but I feel badly for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it seems like, given given not only your personal success, but more importantly, the success of your patients and of your practice speaks for itself. Um, without a doubt. I mean, my practice is primi- pr- 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 uh, primarily um, word of mouth. 
So I couldn't exist if it weren't for word of mouth. Yes, I have a public, uh, you know, I have a public persona and all of that stuff. I mean, that that does exist. But it's it's really it's amazing that I see just families in here. Um, they bring in one family member before I know it, all the other family members or all of their other friends or all of their other workers or all of their other, everybody in their social network. And that to me is extraordinary. That to me is a testament to the fact that this works and what I'm doing is a service that people need and want. And it's crucial to the health of our environment uh, or the health of, and I don't mean environment as in green peace, but environment as in you know, our internal and, and our, our environment in which we live our lives and and, and our, our our feeling of wellness and health and, and how long we're going to live and how how we're going to age in a, in a healthy way. Well, Dr. Fred, when you talk about aging in a healthy way, you also mentioned something a few minutes back about diabetes and, and potentially getting that backwards in, in the mainstream. One thing I wanted to dig into, it's actually two things. First is talking about the cause of diabetes. And the second is the cost of diabetes. What are your thoughts on both of those? Uh, the cost, what did it come out to just the other day? $500 billion per year. Um, for diabetes and what diabetes causes. Imagine how much how much good that could be spent on 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 giving people health care who can't afford it. Uh, if we just cracked the one thing that is breaking the bank right now, which is diabetes and obesity and heart disease because it's associated with all of those things. But diabetes is, is something that we're doing to ourselves because this is not type 1 diabetes where, you, where it's genetically passed on, where you get it as a child generally and, and there's nothing you can do about it. Type two is something that we eat ourselves into. And we're doing that at a very, very rapid pace and we're doing it really, really well. And uh, it's, it's really, there's 70 million, I believe, uh, diabetics or pre-diabetics out there right now. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. That's 25% of our country um, is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And we don't really care. I mean, it's not that we don't really care. We don't do anything because medicine, the model from American medicine is to fix something that's broken, not to prevent something that isn't there. Mm -hmm. And that's what you and I do is to prevent things that aren't there from happening. And there's no way you're going to avoid diabetes if you eat fast food, if you eat too much, if you eat too much sugar and simple carbohydrates, if you don't exercise, you are going to get diabetes. There's just no way around it. And it's... And I used to blame the I used to blame the individual a lot, uh, not having you know, strong enough will to pass up foods and all things like that. But it really is a combination of the fact that the powers that be told us we should be eating low fat foods. It doesn't matter how many carbohydrates we have. It doesn't matter the um, quality of the carbohydrate. It doesn't matter. I mean, the American Diabetes Association still recommends 60 grams of carbohydrates at each meal per person, regardless of where that 60 car grams of carbohydrates come from, um, whether it be pretzels or brown rice. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, so, we're, so we're dealing with an entire public health policy that was started in the 80s, and now 30, you know, a generation later, we've now got this epidemic. So I'm kind of starting to not really, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've always blamed the establishment, but I, I'm starting to not blame the human being so much because we've, we've drilled this, uh, this into them so badly. Don't eat eggs, you'll get cholesterol. Don't eat fat, you'll get cholesterol. Eat low, you know, eat low fat, don't eat salt. Uh, eat only whole grains, you know, just, or, or, just, or eat any grain you want. I mean, sugar's not bad for you. I mean, all of these messages have been over and over again, drilled into people's heads. So what do you expect them to do? You know, they're kind of taught something and they got it, but they got the, but the messaging was wrong from the powers that be. Fred, I couldn't have put it any better myself. I often say that let's, let's draw the analogy to smoking cigarettes a uh, hundred years ago, just a, a few generations ago, right? When we had physicians and, and medical institutions telling us smoking is fine. In fact, it's good for your T-zone. How, how could you get angry at someone for getting lung cancer? Uh, especially, and even, and, and I think there's a, a compounding problem, which is 
let's say you you started smoking during the time when smoking was thought of as as at least not bad for you, and then you become addicted to it, and then the institution starts changing its message. Well, here you are addicted to something, and at, at that point you also have to. Uh, Again, we don't want to just write people a free check to say there's no such thing as personal responsibility because, of course, there is. But when you're dealing with a substance like nicotine or cigarettes, which has been shown to trail only heroin and cocaine in terms of its addictive properties, and now we start to see that there are similar addictive properties in things like refined sugar with the research coming out of Princeton and the University of Florida. High fructose corn syrup. Exactly. It, It starts to become a bit like, Again, we we are all somewhat responsible, but when we're told something is good for us and it's not, and then we become addicted to it, how do we get ourselves out of that? We get ourselves out of it in two ways, one of which we do with anything. Anything that's addictive is that we deal with it one day at a time. Um, One day at a time has been shown to work. We need public health policies that will change, that will change the ability to, to buy giant sodas, to buy... 1,500 calories worth of popcorn at a a movie theater. I mean, that needs to be changed. Um, I don't know. I I mean, I I think there's there's so many levels upon which this has to be changed, but it will never, ever, ever occur until you bring agribusiness into the into the into the conversation Mm -hmm. because they're going to want something out of it. It's going to be awful what they get out of it. And we won't know for another generation what <laughs> awfulness they will get out of it. But we might lose, you know, we might lose the giant bottles of soda and we might lose the the giant things of popcorn. And 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 yes, do I think they need to be banned? Absolutely. Absolutely. We we don't let you smoke in movie theaters. We don't let you take alcohol into movie theaters. We don't let you shoot up heroin and or crack in movie theaters. Why do I have to sit there and hear people crunch? Crunch, crunch, munch, munch. That's all I hear. It makes me crazy, crazy. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's just absurd. And, and not only that, it's the cost. It's the cost of taking care of these people, which is just enormous, enormous. The cost of taking care of these people, simply because they've been told of the wrong message. The messaging has all been wrong. Well, and Fred, I think you hit on a key point there, which is oftentimes we we get into debates about public policy and freedom and individual liberties. And the definition of freedom, I believe, as given by our founding fathers, is that you are free to the extent that your freedom does not limit the freedom of someone else. And that's why, for example, like we've now done away with smoking in public places because your ability to smoke does not, cannot interfere with my ability to not smoke. And I I start to uh, think of similar situations with sugar, especially I like to call it secondhand sugar, where where if uh, the most the most heartbreaking is when you see it maybe in in a a classroom at at a school, there's a birthday celebration and someone brings in cupcakes and. And it's basically the children are forced to eat cupcakes because we all know as kids, if you don't do what the group is doing, that's that's just a, a, a social death wish. You know, you don't well, want to... it happens different. to adults, too. I mean, it yep. happens to adults, too. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, I had a patient this morning who had the same story. Oh, I was out with my children at a hockey game, and then after the hockey game, we went all and did this. And so I had no other choice. I'm like, really? You had no other choice? Really? Somebody was holding a gun to your head. <laughs> You, well, and- you you had another choice. You know, kids, it's different. You know, they're given the cupcakes, whatever. That's a different story. You know, that takes that takes proper parenting. That takes better parenting. That takes way more issues. My biggest issue is why have these things? Why does the school think it's okay to force sugar down these children's throats? I mean, that's that's the biggest issue to me. Is is why do schools think it's okay? And uh, I think it's because well. I'm, Maybe I shouldn't say why I think it's because. Let me just suffice it to say that the heaviest patients I see are school teachers. Well, I think it's it's definitely it becomes. I think it becomes an issue also of our perception of things like sugar. For example, if someone offers you a cigarette and you say no, thank you, I don't smoke, they don't take that as a personal affront. However, if someone bakes a cake and says, would you like a piece? And unless you can say, I'm diabetic and that will kill me, 
or something else, you're going to get some sort of wrinkled brow pointing back at you like, what, you think you're better than me? And that's, that's no, I just, like, I wish we could get a, no, I don't smoke. Or even if you offered a vegetarian a steak and their answer was, I'm a vegetarian, or you offered someone who's kosher pork. Do you think we could ever live in a society where saying I abstain from the things that cause diabetes would be seen as anything less than trying to be an elitist? Yes, I think we can. It's it's just going to take a lot of work and a lot of messaging and a lot of it just it just takes a lot, and it's going to take. And I'm sorry, it is going to take public policy changing. It just is. It's just absolutely going to take public policy changing to do this. And I'm sorry for all the civil libertarians out there, but it just is. And I think that um, I think the more people do this, I mean, look how quickly gluten had had a change around. Now, when people say they're gluten free, people get it. Mm-hmm. There's gluten free restaurants everywhere. I mean, it took what five years, six years. It didn't take long at all for gluten free to be a perfectly acceptable thing. Mm-hmm. So sugar is a little bit more ingrained in our mentality because it's considered such a treat and so special and all of this other stuff. But when is sugar special? When you have it every day, exactly. when you have it at every meal, when it's on every street corner. I mean, that's not special. Well, There's the other thing special about it. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's a challenge too, is I think the, you mentioned it has a different role in our culture and with sugar, we can, when I think of sugar, I think of something that is tastes sweet. And when I think of a sweet taste, that makes me happy. <laughs> However, gluten, uh, like I too am so impressed at how quickly that has been able to become uh, its own thing. But it, it's it's almost because gluten was never a thing to begin with. Like it was, it's just this, 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 I don't know. I mean, how many people are like, no, I'll tell I really you crave gluten. <laughs> I don't, you know, people crave gluten all the time. Are you kidding me? But do they know they crave bread? They crave croissants. Bread. They crave all of that stuff. I mean, they crave that stuff. That's gluten. But the reason why gluten has had a renaissance, it's okay to be gluten free. Guess why? Because there are gluten free products that take its place. Mm-hmm. So you can have a gluten free bagel. So big agribusiness is still making money. Mm. So. When you take sugar away from things, there's a lot of things you've got to, that you just can't replace. Uh, you can't replace the, You can't get a sugar-free cupcake that's as good as a regular one. You can't replace you know sugar-free ice cream that's as good as regular ice cream. You can't replace that as easily because just because it has sugar-free, they've got they'll put something else in it. It'll mm-hmm. be sugar. It'll be brown rice syrup. It'll be this. It'll be that. It'll be something else. It's not going to be true sugar-free. So. I think that's the reason why gluten-free became so much more acceptable because it was something else to feed people. There was something else to sell them. There was mm-hmm. something else for them to buy. Well, absolutely, and I think that, that's uh, – I may have been unclear earlier, but the, the gluten as a individual component, for example, we do not have bags of gluten on our shelves. We've probably never eaten a spoonful of gluten. Gluten is <laughs> – rather, it's, it's a bit of an ingredient that is in things which can be replaced, and the thing that it was in can still be enjoyed, whereas sugar is almost seen as a food group in and of itself. Uh, yes. It is. It is seen as a very pleasant uh, <laughs> um, part of the food chain. If only people would understand just what it does to them by how much you know. One teaspoon of sugar decreases the immune system by what fifty something percent, and two teaspoons decreases the immune system's ability to do its job by over seventy five percent. The average American consumes thirty three teaspoons of sugar a day. Think about that one. Mm-hmm. Why are you sick? There's why you're sick. There's why you don't feel well. Uh, think about that. And I think I just think sugar is is sugar is the biggest enemy we have right now. And it's going to take a long time to get people to think that way, and to find different foods that are their comfort foods and their their go-to foods and their foods that they use when they're depressed and all this other stuff. But well, Fred, how how much hope is there for? fat, uh, natural fat to fill that role. It seems, it seems like oftentimes comfort foods are both the combination of fat and sugar, which together are, are no fun, but just enjoying getting back to enjoying 
whole food fats. I mean, you're obviously a huge fan of, of the wonderful source of uh, monounsaturated fats, macadamia nuts, but could, could we swap sugar for fat? Uh, we could, and I try to do that in my practice and, you know, in the diets that I preach and all of that stuff. Um, I think avocados are great. I mean, there's so many great sources of fat that satisfy you way more than sugar does. I mean, think about having eggs, uh, and studies tell you this, have eggs for breakfast versus people who have pancakes for breakfast. The ones who have pancakes for breakfast will be hungrier way sooner than the ones who have, uh, who have eggs for breakfast. The satiety is completely different. So I just think uh, it's almost as if we've got to create this culture where food went back to the way food used to be, which was food was for sustenance, mm -hmm. not food as in. And that's not to say we should never celebrate. We should never have a birthday celebration. We should never have Christmas or Kwanzaa or Easter or whatever or Passover. Of course we should. But those should be special occasions. Mm -hmm. Those should not be. There's no reason why we subsidize sugar. There's no reason why sugar is cheaper now than it was at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. There's not 2000, 1900. Um, I date myself. And, um, <laughs> and I mean, there's just no reason why candy bars are as cheap as they are. There's no reason why soda is as cheap as it is. It's, it's because we subsidize sugar. And that's why. And uh, maybe if we subsidize something that was healthy, uh, we would be able to have a healthier, uh, a healthier place from which to choose foods but until such time when it's when it's cheaper for me when a dollar can buy me you know 400 calories at mcdonald's or 50 calories in a grocery store what am i going to do if i only have a dollar mm -hmm. i'm going to get a happy meal i'm not going to get you know an orange i'm going to get a happy meal so there's a lot of, this is so deep this this conversation and this 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 uh, this problem, it's so deep and it's so uh, it reaches into uh, it's like it's like a fungus. The mycelia are just everywhere. <laughs> trying to trying to uh, tease out one from the other is just really really hard. And um, you know until we make major changes and just teach people that you need to eat different things, it's or different things are are good for you. And good for you is okay, and not good for you is something we do, you know, five days a week or three days a week, and then it's okay to do the others. I don't know. You know, I also, look, I have issues with, you know, I have issues with the television show Mike and Molly. You know, I have issues with a lot of things that think obesity is okay. You know, I just, I mean, I have real issues with that. Um, but, you know, that's just me. That's just me being crazy. But. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think you're crazy, Doctor Fred. And and in fact, to I want to I want to make sure we end the podcast on a on a note of hope because I do think this is a, a hopeful situation. I think we've made dramatic progress. And if you could give three steps or three tips, the top three things that our listeners could do to help avoid diabetes or to help uh, address diabetes that they currently have, it's same thing with obesity. What would those top three tips be? Uh, don't drink soda or fruit juice. I think that's, that's a real easy thing to do. It's really easy to swap out that because that's a, that's a simple, that, that is just wasted calories, uh, and, 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 and filled with sugar. So that's one thing that they can do. Second thing they have to do is exercise. Exercise is critical to, uh, to warding off diabetes. And I don't care what kind of exercise you do, just do something, just move. And then the third thing is be consistent with what you do. Be consistent with these changes that you make. It's not something that you're going to start tomorrow. It's something you're going to start today. And it's something that you can overcome. I mean, you do everything else in your life. You go to work. You raise children. You have a successful relationship. You have families. Those are way harder than choosing not to eat sugar. Mm -hmm. Way harder. Mm -hmm. Way harder. So when you think about all the wonderful things you do in your life every day that are really hard, eating should not be one of them. Eating should be something that's really easy to make a healthy decision. Brilliant. Brilliant. Folks, uh, hopefully you can tell the brilliance that is Dr. Pescatori because – the man, the man knows what he's talking about, and the man has a, a beautiful heart as well as a beautiful mind. So please check out his work. If you haven't read The Hamptons Diet, 
please do so. You can also check out the amazing amount of content he gives away for free on his website, which is drpescatory.com. And that's Dr. D-R-P as in Paul, E-S-C-A-T-O-R-E.com. And Fred, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, that's, can I get out one more thing? Oh, please, yes. LogicalHealthAlternatives.com. You can sign up for my newsletter that's free. It's an e-newsletter. It comes out four times a week. I love it. I love it. Well, Fred, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And listeners, thank you for joining us. And remember that this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Talk with you soon.